You know, history is filled with stories that could have ended differently had someone just listened. I think about stories, that famous stories, stories like um, the Titanic, the story of the Titanic. You know, it didn't have to end that way. It didn't have to end with 1,500 people perishing. It didn't have to end with all those people dying. It just didn't have to. They were warned. They knew about the ice. Other ships had warned them. Other people had warned them. But they didn't listen. They didn't pay attention. Could have ended differently, but it didn't because they didn't listen. There's lots of famous stories like that, but I want to tell you today about a lady you've probably never heard of. Her name is Sharia. Sharia was 33 years old and in the absolute best shape of her entire life. She had always dreamed of accomplishing one thing and doing one thing. She wanted to climb Mount Everest and get to the top of the world. On May 18th, 2012, she woke up in her tent at base camp number four. If you don't know anything about climbing Mount Everest, base camp number four is the last place you stop before you go to the summit. It's the highest place on the mountain. You can take a little break, get a little sleep, suck on some oxygen before you push on to the top. She was there ready to make her dreams come true. And she wasn't alone. That day, over 200 other climbers were also planning on going to the top of the world. Those 200 other climbers had some 300 other people with them, Sherpas, guides, people carrying things along the route. So there were 500 people expected that day to make the ascent. Cher got out of her tent and talked to her guide, and her guide said, we shouldn't go today. He said, it's going to be too crowded on the mountain. Let's go tomorrow. He also didn't feel like she was a strong enough climber to endure a day like today was going to be because due to the number of people, he knew it would take them over 20 hours to get up and back. And he didn't think she had the strength to do it. He also said, we're starting too late. We're going to be at the back of the line. We're going to be the last ones to get to the top. We're going to be the last ones to get back. And the weather is going to change in about 10 hours. And it's going to make our trek even more difficult. About 10 hours into the trek, the weather was still pretty good. But the Sherpa went to her and said, we need to turn around. He said, you're not going to be able to make it. And even if you do make it to the top, I'm scared you're not going to be strong enough to get back to Camp 4. He said, the weather is going to change. I know it hasn't yet, but it's going to change. And it's going to make this a lot harder than it already is. But she refused and decided to press on. She wouldn't listen. A few hours later, she was warned again, this time by some other guides and some other Sherpas and some other climbers who tried to talk her out of it. But she wasn't a quitter. She was determined to prove them wrong. And you know what she did? On May 18th, 2012, at 2.30 in the afternoon, there she was on top of the world taking her pictures and her dreams had come true. She had made it to the summit of Everest. She stayed there about 30 minutes taking pictures, taking in the view, doing what they do, and then decided to head down back to Camp 4 and the relative safety she could find there. On the way down, though, she started to struggle about an hour in. She was in a lot of pain. She was having trouble staying on her feet. She was on her ninth bottle of oxygen. And her speech had started to become slurred. Her Sherpa guides took turns pulling and pushing and at times carrying her, trying to encourage her to stay on her feet and keep moving. Just as the guide had predicted, the weather took a drastic turn, making the descent even harder. Several more hours passed, and Sharia was unable to move on her own. Standing over her were several Sherpas who had been trying to help her get down the mountain. And they were trying to strategize a way to save her life. She was laying in the snow, looking up, unable to do anything on her own. And the last words she ever spoke were these two. Save me. But they couldn't. They couldn't save her and save themselves. They were all running out of oxygen. Some of them were completely out. They had no way to get her to Camp 4. 
She died there in the snow, clamped to the climbing rope with her face down on May 19th. She was 820 feet from Camp 4 because despite countless warnings, she did not listen. Four other climbers died on the same day on the same mountain. All of them, just like her, had had many warnings as well, but they failed to listen. Her final words were, save me, and I'm sure she didn't see it this way, but the fact is they'd been trying to save her since she woke up that morning. Her guides were trying to save her before she ever started up the mountain with their warnings. They tried to save her halfway in. They tried to save her multiple times by telling her to turn around. Don't go any further. You've got to stop. But she didn't listen. So she died. The big idea for today is this. We all need to listen to and we need to learn from our guide. We need to listen to and we need to learn from our guide. The Holy Spirit is our guide. Jesus said this, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you, guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. That's John 16, 13. He will guide you. Paul declared in Romans 8, 14, for all those led by God's spirit are God's sons. Who's leading you? Who's guiding you? Who are you listening to this day? Proverbs chapter 4 is our text, starting in verse 10. Hear these words. It says, listen, my son, listen. Accept my words and you will live many years. I'm teaching you the way of wisdom. I'm guiding you on straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. That sure sounds good. When you run, you will not stumble. That sounds even better, except the running part. But then he says this in verse 13, hold on to instruction, don't let it go, guard it, for it is your life. Keeping off the path of the wicked, don't proceed on the way of the evil ones, avoid it, don't travel on it, turn away from it, and pass it by. For they can't sleep unless they have done what is evil, they are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble, they eat the bread of wickedness, and they drink the wine of violence. We all need to listen and we all need to learn from our guide. And you know what? Sometimes God allows us to be the guide for other people. Sometimes that's the way the Holy Spirit works. Parents, that's part of your job as a parent. You have a God-given responsibility and role in your home to guide your children to the Lord. Because if you don't guide them, someone will. If you don't guide them, social media will. If you don't guide them, YouTube will. If you don't guide them, their friends will. If you don't guide them, someone will. You're called to guide them. We're called to live our lives like this, where we are in step with God because he's guiding us. And then we're also living our life in a way that we can help guide others. Our text said, listen, my son, accept my words and you will live many years. I'm teaching you the way of wisdom. I'm guiding you on straight paths. He's talking to his sons. And he's talking to us. All these thousands of years later, this great advice he was giving his sons is still great advice for us today. Let me ask you a question. By by show of hands... How many of you have had a godly person at one time or another help guide you in some way? Yeah, me too. Now let me ask you this. How many of you, by show of hands, at one time or another have helped guide somebody else in some way? This is the way it's supposed to work. We're supposed to be in tune with God, our guide, and then he helps us guide others when the time arises. But in order for us to do that, we have to listen and we have to learn from our guide. Here in our passage, we find two things that we are encouraged to do, and we find one thing we're encouraged not to do. Let's look at the two we're encouraged to do first. The first is we're encouraged to hold it. We're encouraged to hold on to instruction. There's an important, emphatic command in verse 13. It's not a hard one to understand, but it's a hard one to actually do in our lives. And I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. But here's what it says in verse 13. Hold on to instruction. Don't let go. 
Hold on to it. Don't let go of it. In other words, it's not enough simply to listen to sound advice. It's not enough to hear wisdom. You have to actually listen to it, and then you have to hold on to it and not let go of it. But the reality is we're poor listeners, aren't we? Anybody got a poor listener living in their house? Don't point at them. You don't need to point at them. (laughs) But you know what a poor listener is? Anybody work with a poor listener? If you don't know a poor listener, you're probably the one everybody else is thinking about, (laughs) right? We're poor listeners. We don't listen particularly good. I've told you guys this story before, but it illustrates the point so well. Not long after Abby and I were married, we were young newlyweds, and um, we had finished our dinner that evening, and Abby mentioned that we needed a gallon of milk. We were out of milk. We were both eating cereal at that time in our lives, and we wanted milk for breakfast the next day. She said, we're out of milk. I'm going to have to run to the store and get some. And, you know, I wanted to be a good husband and support my wife, so I said, I'll go to the store and get a gallon of milk. That's a simple job, right, men? Something I should be able to handle. The truth is, we didn't have a dishwasher, and I didn't want to wash the dishes. That's why I volunteered to go to the store. But I volunteered to go to the store. So I gathered up my things and got ready to head out. And Abby told me, and I remember her telling me this, she said, a gallon of milk is all we need. She said, don't buy anything we don't need because we don't get paid for another week. At that time in our life, like most young people, young newlyweds, money was really tight. It was really hard to come by. We were living on a very strict budget. We were trying to pay debt off. We were, I mean, we, we, we just didn't have a whole lot. And she said, don't buy anything we don't need because we don't get paid for another week. So I said, okay, no problem. Gallon of milk, off I go. So I go, I get in the store. I go right to where the milk is. I, buy, I get the gallon of milk. I put it in my hands. And then a thought crossed my head. I said, you know what, it's almost deer season, and I'm going to need a hunting license, and there's not many people in the store right now, so I bet there's no line. I'm just going to grab my hunting license, because I I need that, right? So I started walking from where the milk was to where the deer license was, which is on the other side of the store. And as I made that walk, I saw it. A 27-inch flat screen TV. Now, this was a long time ago, y'all, and I know some of y'all are like, flat screen TV is no big deal, but I'm telling you, back then, flat screen TV was a big deal. It was a really big deal. Flat screen TVs back then were like 2000 3000 bucks. Maybe occasionally you'd find a, a one for like 1500 or 1800 Like, only the richest of the rich had flat screen TVs. And I had never in my life dreamed I would have a flat screen TV. I mean, this is back when all the TVs or most of the TVs in the store were still the big tube TVs. And there would be like two or three flat screens you could pick from. But there it was, 27-inch flat screen TV right out in the middle of the aisle I was walking down for $998. It was on sale. And I said, that puppy is for me. And she said not to buy anything we don't need, but we needed it. Because our old tube TV had actually gone out a month before. We didn't have a TV. And so in my pea brain, I thought, you know what? We really need that. And it's on sale and it's a good deal. And I wanted a flat screen TV. So I bought it. I got home, I'll never forget, walking in with that gallon of milk and telling Abby I had to go back and get the TV. (laughs) She said, TV? I told you to get a gallon of milk. So I got the gallon of milk. And a flat screen. She said, a flat screen? Carried that thing in. She didn't yell at me. It wasn't a a fight. But, you know, I could tell she was a little disappointed that I had swiped that credit card to get that flat screen TV. Y'all think that's bad. Another time, I went to buy some rabbit cages. Some people, this lady had these rabbit cages on sale on Facebook Marketplace. I needed some more rabbit cages for some rabbits. So I said, I'm going to go. If I can get a good deal, I'm going to buy them from her. Abby said, okay, good. So I left the house. I came back. She, uh, she said, did you get a good deal? And I said, nah, not really. She was really firm on the price. She didn't want to come down. I bought them anyway. It's a good enough deal. I said, I didn't get a very good deal on those cages. But I think I got a good deal on the house. And she said, what? And I said, yeah, I told her we'd buy her house. 
And she said, you said what? And I said, I told her we'd buy our house. It's the house we've been praying for for like three years. It's perfect for our family. We've been looking for a house for a long time. She said, you're kidding me. I said, no. She said, you can come look at it if you want, but we're going to buy her house. <laughs> so we loaded up. We went over and looked at it, and she loved it. We still live there today. That's how we got our house. <laughs> I went to buy a rabbit cage, and I bought a house instead. So um, that's what living with me is like, ladies. So uh, just... <laughs> Don't think Abby has it so great. <laughs> the bottom line is we're not real good listeners, are we? We're easily distracted. We don't hold on to instruction very well. It's easy for us to get on a path we didn't intend to get on. It reminds me of scriptures like Isaiah 48, 17 that says this. This is what the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel says. I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you for your benefit, who leads you in the way you should go. It's for your benefit. It's the way you should go. And then look at verse 18. If only you had paid attention. If only you had listened, he said, to my commands, then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your descendants would have been as countless as the sand and the offspring of your body like its grains. Their name would not be cut off or eliminated from my presence. The problem was they hadn't listened and they had let go of what God had told them. In this time in history, the people of God had totally rejected the law of God. They had rejected the commands of God. They had rejected the instruction of the Lord. They had not held on to what they knew was true and righteous and holy and instead, they just let go of it and did what they wanted to do. And that put them on a path that was not a good path. In fact, if you go back to Isaiah chapter 5, we can see that they just let go of what God gave them. Isaiah 5, 24, Therefore, as a tongue of fire consumes straw and as dry grass shrivels in the flame, so their roots will become like something rotten and their blossoms will blow away like dust. For they have rejected the instruction of the Lord of armies. They didn't hold on to it. And they have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. And because they did that, it put them on a path of pain, a path of suffering, a path of tragedy. Because they did not hold on to the instruction they had received, because they did not listen to their guide, they ended up at a destination they never wanted to be at. You see, it's possible to end up on the wrong path due to our ignorance. I've been on that path before. I've gotten on paths that weren't the right path just because I was ignorant. But you know what? If we're honest, most of the time it's not our ignorance. It's our arrogance that gets us on the wrong path. Because we think we know better than God. We think we know better than that old-fashioned Bible book that everybody talks about and wants me to read. But golly, it was written so long ago, it can't have much to say to me today. We think we know better than our parents and our grandparents. That's not ignorance, that's arrogance. We think we know better than our Sherpas who are trying to get us to the summit, so we press on because we know better. We don't hold on to the wisdom and the instruction we have received. We let it go. And then we end up on a path we don't want to be on. That's why I'm telling you, we all need to listen and we all need to learn from our guide. The Spirit is our guide. God's Word is our guide. And we need to listen and hold on to it. Don't let it go. Even if there's a shiny TV on sale, don't just better hold on. Okay. Number two, we've got to guard it. We've got to guard it, not just hold it, but we've got to guard it. Guarding it's a little bit different than holding it. The Hebrew word here for holding on to it means to hold on strongly with great intent to take hold of something. The Hebrew word for guard here is, is a little bit different. It's used about 60 times in Scripture, and it's a, it's a very serious word. It's a word that can be used in a variety of ways, but it, it basically means to watch something closely. We might say today, keep a close eye on it. Keep a close eye on it. It's used like this in Proverbs 13. The one who guards keeps a close eye on his mouth protects his life. The one who opens his lips invites his own ruin. Or Psalms 141, which says, Lord, set up a guard 
for my mouth. Watch it closely, Lord. Keep watch at the door of my lips. Another example would be Nahum 2.1, which says, One who scatters is coming up against you. Man the fortifications. Watch the road. Keep a close eye on it. Brace yourself. Summon all your strength. The idea is that you are watching something with the intent to protect it. You're keeping a close eye on it in order to protect it. Our text teaches us that to walk a straight path, we have not to only hold on to the instruction of the Lord, but we've got to guard it. We've got to keep a close eye on it. And there's a reason for that. (laughs) And it's an important reason. Look at verse 13 again. Hold on to instruction. Don't let go. Guard it, for it is your life. That's the reason. We hold on to it and we guard it. It is your life. That sounds important. And I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, oh, come on, Pastor. Like, I'm not going to die if I don't listen to God. I'm not going to die if I don't listen to the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to die if I don't listen to my guide. I mean, I'm not going to die just because I, I didn't listen once or twice or got on a path that I knew I probably shouldn't go down. Well, you know, that's exactly what Sharia thought, too. She died 800 feet from camp. It also sounds exactly like what the devil told Eve in the garden. You remember that? No, you will certainly not die, he told her. In fact, God knows that when you eat, your eyes are going to be opened and you're going to be like God, knowing good and evil. Just eat it. You're not going to die. That's a joke. Church, when God says, trust me, when God says, Take me at my word. When God says, hold on to my instruction. When God says, guard my instruction, for this is your life. He ain't messing around. He is being very, very serious. Because if you don't, you will end up with your face in the snow, sucking on an empty bottle of oxygen, wondering, how did I get here? Why am I on this path? Why does it hurt this bad? Why is my life such a mess? Why is this so hard? Well, it's because you didn't hold on and you didn't guard the instruction and the advice that your guide gave you. Any of y'all ever heard of a guy by the name of Franklin P. Jones? Some of y'all are probably old enough to have heard of him. He was popular back in the 40s and 50s. He had this column he wrote. He was a syndicated columnist. It was called... Uh, Put it this way, it was in a lot of newspapers. He would find unique and funny ways of looking at things. For example, he would say things like, the problem with being punctual is that no one is there to appreciate it. (laughs) He's not wrong. Or he would say things like, a fanatic is someone who sticks to their guns whether they are loaded or not. Not wrong. Now, this one is his, ladies. It's not mine. I'm going to read it word for word, his words, okay? He says, all women should know how to take care of children because most of them will have a husband someday. He ain't wrong. (laughs) Those are funny when you think about them, but he also said a good one about listening and learning, and I think this one really nails the main problem most of us have. He said, one advantage of talking to yourself is that you know at least somebody's listening. See, a lot of us would rather talk to ourselves than talk to God because we're not sure if he's listening or not. But when we talk to ourselves, we know we're listening. I think most of us spend way more time talking to ourselves than we actually do talking to God. A lot of us pray, but when we're praying, we're really just talking to ourselves. We're listening to ourselves. We're coming up with the plan ourselves. We're not really listening to our guide. We talk to ourselves because we know we're listening. We talk to ourselves because it's a whole lot easier to convince ourselves to do something that's wrong than to convince him we should do something that's wrong. We talk to ourselves and we tell ourselves things like, well, nobody's going to care, nobody's going to know about it. Everybody else is doing it. We tell ourselves whatever we have to tell ourselves so we can go and do whatever we want to do. And then when our life becomes filled with pain and hardship and we find ourselves with a face full of snow, we look up to God and we say, save me. 
And the reality is he's been trying to save you the whole time. Been trying to save you since you left camp. I read a quote some time ago by a guy by the name of Stephen Covey. And man, it just cut me to the bone, not because Stephen Covey's a great theological genius, but because in this quote, I immediately saw a scary and profound spiritual reality at that time in my life. I saw that how I was communicating with the Lord was, was not a biblical way of communicating with the Lord. It was not a healthy way of communicating with the Lord. And, and it was not an honest way to communicate with the Lord. And honestly, I think this describes most people and how they communicate with the Lord. He said this. He said, most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. That's really the problem with your teenagers. It's not that they don't listen. It's just that they're not listening to you with the intent of understanding. They're listening to you with the intent of replying. They already know what they're going to say. But no matter what you say, they've already got a reply, don't they? I wonder if we look like that to God. Like when we're praying, are we really trying to understand when we're reading the Bible? Are we really trying to understand or are we just trying to find a justification, a loophole, a way around it? I mean, this really hurts. It's like, ouch, Stephen, you didn't have to say it like that. But he's right. When, when we come to the Lord, we're not looking to understand we're just looking for our opportunity to reply, to tell God what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and that it's going to be okay. Because most of us aren't really interested in understanding God. We're not really interested in understanding the path and the purpose he has for our lives. We're just interested in getting on the path we want to go down. We've already developed our reply. We already have our justifications. We already have our excuses. We already have all of our reasons worked out. And we just need an opportunity to tell him about it before we go and do it. But that's not anything like what we're reading we're supposed to do in Proverbs 4.13. He says, hold on to instruction. Don't let go. Guard it, for it is your life. You see, we all need to listen to and learn from our guide or we will never walk the kind of path that's described here in our text where it says, I'm teaching you the way of wisdom. I'm guiding you on straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. When you run, you will not stumble. That sounds so good, but that doesn't happen if we're not listening to our guide. If that's the kind of path you want to walk or run on, then you got to listen to the guide. Here's the last thing, the third thing that we say we see here, and this is kind of a negative here, but um, it's put in kind of a negative. But he says simply this, keep off it. The last part of our text today is a, a good piece of advice. It's something any good guide will tell you because a good guide is not just there to keep you on the right path. A good guide that is there to keep you off the wrong paths. Think about how you are parenting your children, right? You're not just showing them the best path. You're also saying, don't go on that one because I went on that one. That one's not good. I've been there. Now, they may not listen to you, but you're trying to keep them off the bad path, aren't you? Because a good, path, a good guide won't just put you on the right path. A good guide will keep you from going down the wrong path. And so that's what he's saying here. He says there's some you just got to keep off of. We've already talked about this a good bit in our series, so I'm not going to linger here long. But the reality is, is part of finding the right path is being able to have the wisdom to avoid the wrong ones. And our guide will help us do that if we'll listen to him. Listen to this next part. Of the verse, keep off the path of the wicked, verse 14. Keep off the path of the wicked. Don't proceed on the way of evil ones. Avoid it. Don't travel on it. Turn away from it and pass it by. For they can't sleep unless they've done what is evil. They're robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. They eat the bread of wickedness and they drink the wine of violence. That's some solid advice right there. There are really four main things he tells us to do here, and they come in levels. We're going to do these real quick. The first one is the easiest one, and it's the one we should do. And if we do this one, we don't have to do any of the others. The first one is avoid it. He says avoid the bad paths, the wicked paths. Just don't go down it. Problem solved. Keep off any path that God has already marked with a sign of danger. You know, God has put signs up on a lot of the paths we walk. He says, danger, this is not a good one. Don't go this way. But a lot of us, we look at the sign and we go, eh. 
Probably wouldn't hurt me, though. You say, well, what are you talking about? I'm talking about things like greed, immorality, sexual sin, homosexuality, deceitful thinking, deceitful actions, lying, lust, hate, murder, adultery, idolatry, debt. Things God has already very clearly said, don't go that way. Addictions, right? You, you don't have to pray, Lord, um, Lord, should, should, should I buy the meth? You don't have to pray that prayer. God has already said no. You, you don't, I mean, there's some things you don't have to think about or pray about in a spiritual sense because God has already said, that's the wrong path. Avoid it. Don't go down it. You don't have to pray, Lord, should, should I cheat on my spouse? Would this be okay? Because God has already said no. And you know he's already said no. Right? These are the paths that we should just avoid. Don't walk down them and then problem solved. The problem is we see that and we go, mm, yeah, but it's probably not going to hurt me. But hey, oh, man, it might be fun. I'm just going to give it a try. I'm just going to go a little ways down it. Probably won't hurt anything. But then what happens every time we go down that path? We get hurt, and other people get hurt. We can't, we can't look at the danger sign and say, well, everybody else is doing it, so I should too. No, he says avoid it. And if you can find the courage to listen to your guide and just avoid that path altogether, your problem is completely solved. But what if, like so many others, you start down one of those paths, one of those wrong paths? Well, then he says the second thing, don't keep going down it. This makes really good sense. When you realize you're on the wrong path, stop walking. Don't go any further. Don't walk another step. Don't live on it another day. Don't pretend like it's not a problem another minute. Don't proceed, he says, on the way of evil ones. Stop. You got to stop walking, stop running on the wrong path. And the sooner you do that, the better for you and everybody else around you. And then he says you have to turn away from it. That's the next one. Once you stop and go, this isn't right, then you turn away from whatever path you're on and you reject it and you go a different direction. You turn away from the wrong path in an effort to get back to the right one. We might need to ask God for forgiveness at that point. We might need to ask other people for forgiveness at that point. This is going to be our time of lamenting, our time of confession, our time of repentance, where we are turning away from the wrong path and getting back on the right path. But the bottom line is we turn away from it and we turn back to God. And then this last one is, is really good and it's important. He says, pass by it. And I think this is so wise and so important because there's nothing new under the sun. The devil's using all the same tricks he's always used to get all of us on the wrong path. And it's only a matter of time before you're going to come across another opportunity to walk or run down a wrong path. So why Solomon advises us here, he says, hey, next time pass by it. Avoid it. Don't go down it. Learn from the last time. Listen to your guide this time and just pass right by that path you shouldn't be on. Don't have any part in the wicked or evil paths in life. That's solid advice. Let me close with this. We all need to listen and learn from our guide. You know what the saddest thing about Sharia's story is? She didn't have to die. The Sherpas could have saved her. In fact, they had been trying to save her for over 30 hours when she finally died. They tried to show her a better path. They tried to tell her not to go. They tried to tell her, wait another day when the weather will be better, when things will be more favorable for someone in your condition. She was a great climber. She was in the best shape of her life. But they knew she wasn't as strong as she needed to be for that day. For 500 people being on the mountain, for the weather that was going to change, for all the other things, they knew this was going to be dangerous. But she wouldn't listen. The day after she died, the weather was incredible on Everest. One of the best weather days the mountain had ever had. 
And you know what else? There was almost nobody on the mountain climbing that day because all 500 of those other people had rushed up. There were very few people at Camp 4 waiting to go up on that good weather day. The day her Sherpas wanted her to leave and go. In fact, on that day, all the climbers who went up had to climb over and around her body, which was still clipped to the rope. They passed right by her corpse on the way up. Many people made record times on the way up that day. It was so easy and so clear. It's crazy how different her story would have been if she would have just listened to her guide and waited one more day. There is one big difference between those Sherpas and our guide. Our guide is God. He's the creator of the universe. He doesn't grow weary or faint. He doesn't need sleep or oxygen bottles to sustain his life. And he can pull us out of the pit and save our wretched souls and make us as white as snow at any time he wants to. But like Sharia, you've got to look up and say, save me. You've got to look up and say, Lord, save me. And in that moment, he will. If you believe and if you confess that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. That's what the Bible says. If you repent of your sins and give your life to him, you will be saved. But you've got to say, save me. If you're here today and haven't been saved and don't know the Lord, I pray you would do that. And then I pray you'd spend the rest of your life doing exactly what I'm doing, trying to listen to my guide and walking down the right paths as much as I can. Let's pray. If you're here and have never said yes to Jesus, we're going to give you an opportunity to do just that. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front or to meet us at the back. I'm just going to ask you to pray right there where you are to the Lord of heaven and earth, the God of this universe. Just say, Lord, it's me. Save me. By faith, I ask that you would forgive me. I repent of my sins and give my life to you this hour. Come and live inside of me to guide me, to help me, to change me. Lord, I thank you for your love and your goodness and for your willingness to save me for your ability to save me. I thank you for the cross of Calvary that makes my salvation a reality. I thank you for your goodness and your grace. Lord, as we close today, I... I don't want to be too hard on this poor woman who didn't listen to her guide because I haven't listened to mine most of the time either. We're all guilty of that. We've just gotten away with it when she didn't. But a time is coming when we won't. A time is coming when we will take a path that you clearly have marked danger on or you've clearly told us to stay away from, but we take it anyway where we won't get away from it. Where it will cost us dearly. Maybe not our physical lives, but it'll cost us financially, it'll cost us relationally, it'll cost us spiritually, it'll cost us in some way. So Lord, I pray we would be committed to listening to you, to listening to your word, to following your instruction, to guarding it and holding on to it. So that we can be on the path that you have for us, the path that is not hindered. The path where we can run and walk without the obstacles in our way. Lord, help us to have the courage to choose that path over the others. I know there are people in this room right now, Father, and people listening right now who are on some paths they know they need to get off of and they don't know how to get off of them. Lord, guide them. Help them to have the courage to be quiet and to listen this week. And I pray you would speak to them and move in their situation and their lives in such a clear way that they know it's you. Father, we ask and we pray this now in Jesus' name.